John Howard, welcome to Insiders. Welcome back to Insiders. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's good to see you again. You were uh, our first guest 10 years ago, and that was the day after the Aston by-election. That was a by-election that your government was supposed to lose. Mm. That was a real turning point. Oh, it was. I said at the time that uh, we were back in the game. Uh, if we'd have lost the Aston by-election, which by all uh, uh, history we should have, uh, it would have further depressed the then government and given the Labor Party an enormous boost, but we didn't, and uh, I thought to myself, uh, we can win this, and it really was the turning point. That, uh, if it had turned out that way, that would have been a very short career for you. It, it certainly would have been, and I, rem I remember the evening very well, because not only uh, did, did we hold Aston, but of course the Wallabies defeated the British Lions, in the, and I was, if I remember right, I was very hoarse on the program. You were. It, it was laryngitis and cheering for the Wallabies. And then, of course, very soon after that, Tampa, mm. and, and then September 11 happened. Um, they were dramatic events, and that had a real impact on the way people saw national security. Now, that worked for you as well. Oh, yes. Uh, my view is that if Tampa and uh, September 11 had not happened, uh, we still would have won because Aston indicated that people had grave doubts about Labor and still had some faith in us as economic managers, but the majority would have been smaller. Now, ten years ago, asylum seekers was a big issue. It still is. Mm. It just seems as if nothing has been resolved. No, well, the big mistake, you forgive me saying it, was for the Rudd government to reverse the successful policy of the Howard government because it had disappeared as an issue, as a problem. I mean, in, in 2001, something like five to 6,000 illegal arrivals were there. The following year, that had dwindled to one or two, and they were the figures of the Immigration Department, not mine. There, there was a dramatic impact from our Pacific solution and all of that, and that policy should never have been changed. Now, of course, we, we, we are satisfying nobody. We've got hundreds more people in detention. Uh, there's a sense in the Australian community that we've lost control of our borders again. The Australian people will always support uh, high immigration and a reasonable refugee intake if they think the government is running the show and the government's not being pushed around by others. And the Malaysian agreement, do you think that will help, given that, that one aspect of that is to increase the number of refugees coming out of Malaysia? Look, uh, I'll leave comment on the, on the current policy to... Uh, uh, to, to the opposition and to the government. Uh, I simply note the hypocrisy, though, that you can sign an agreement with Malaysia that's not a signatory to the um, Convention on Refugees, but, of course, you can't do something with Nauru because she's not a signatory. You know, that's hypocrisy, really. But there have been big changes in the 10 years uh, since that first interview. The political debate now just seems to be... Um, it, it's not as substantial as it once was. I think people worry about the quality of leadership in this country. Do you see it that way? Oh, I'm not as pessimistic as that. I think, um, I think Tony Abbott's doing a fantastic job. I think the problem at the moment uh, is that the current Prime Minister uh, appears to lack any authority uh, because of the very equivocal outcome from the last election. I make this prediction. Uh, at the next election, the, the public will vote very heavily one way or the other. Uh, I think the Greens have peaked. You, you probably think that that's counterintuitive that the Greens are, you know, going on from strength to strength. I think the Greens are starting to alarm people. I think they are increasingly seen as the real extremists in Australian politics. And Australians don't like extremists. And I hope, for example, that uh, the next federal election, the Liberal Party puts the Labor Party ahead of the Greens in the, in the seat of Melbourne. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think Green policies are much worse than Labor policies. Well, when you say they, they'll vote heavily one way or the other, mm. do you seriously think there's still a chance that they'll vote heavily in favour of Labor? Well, at the polls would suggest not, but it's two years to go. I mean, I, I think the coalition will win, but can I just say to my friends and colleagues, don't take anything for granted. Uh, you've got to... And there can be huge turns around. I mean, my poll ratings at the beginning of 2001 were terrible. Uh, in fact, they were worse than Kevin Rudd's were when the Labor Party dumped him, which shows the level of panic uh, that they embraced in making that decision. So your message to Julia Gillard, not that you should want to give it, but you hang in there. Well, my, 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 my message to my colleagues, I, I won't presume to send message <laughs> to Julia Gillard, is, is uh, uh, yes, you're doing very well at the moment. I think Abbott's a great leader and he's got a laser-like focus on the weakness of the government. And I, sure, but at some point, though, should, should he become more positive? Is there a need look, for him to be more positive? Look, look he will. Uh, he will, but um, the, the only issue in town at the moment uh, is the carbon tax issue. 
and, and he is right to focus on it, uh, almost to the exclusion of everything else. But he's got another two years, and as he rightly says, he'll, he'll bring things out. But you look at where the Liberal Party was until he took over. Uh, he brought the Liberal Party back from the dead, and he went within one seat of overturning 100 years of Australian political history, and, and that is turning out a first-term government except in the special circumstances of Scullin's defeat during the Great Depression, and they were special circumstances. On the carbon tax, you went to the 2007 mm. election uh, supporting an ETS. What's so wrong with it now? Well, the rest of the world's not doing it. Whereas, whereas the whole basis of what we put forward in 2007 was that the rest of the world was inexorably moving towards a carbon tax, and yet that's not... You, you told the National Press Club in July 2007 that in the years to come, it will provide a model for other nations mm. to follow. Mm. Peter Shergold, who advised mm. you at the time, talked about getting out in front. Mm. Yeah, I know he, he, he did do that, but the, the very first sentence of the terms of reference for the Shergold inquiry was that we had to absolutely preserve the competitive position of Australian industries because of the preeminence of fossil fuels. And the whole uh, basis on which we went uh, to the people with that policy and the belief was that the rest of the world would follow and would be going in the same direction but they're not. I mean the Americans and I've just been in the United States and there's no chance in the world of the Americans embracing an emissions trading system. The Indians aren't, the Chinese aren't and we are crazy to be going ahead of the rest of the world. If the rest of the world were adopting a different attitude well then a different attitude might be countenance, but the, the whole scene's changed. In 2007, people were sort of almost dancing in the streets in favour of these measures. Since then, we've had the global financial crisis, we've had the collapse in Copenhagen, and the whole uh, atmospheric uh, of the debate has altered. Because you did say then at the press club that being among the first to move will bring new opportunities and we intend to grasp them. Mm -hmm. You're making the judgment now that the world won't move. Well, you, you wouldn't want to be wrong make, because you'll lose those opportunities. You know, I'm making I'm making the judgment now, which is you know based on evidence of the last three years. I mean, the Canadians and Canada is the country most like Australia when it comes to this. Canadians have just voted in a government which is totally opposed, given the majority in its own right, which is totally opposed to an ETS or a carbon tax. Four years ago the likelihood was, the belief was, perhaps more than the empirical likelihood, but the belief was that the world was going to go in this direction. That has changed. And on top of that, I think it's fair to say that uh, some of the views have shifted on the science. I, I, people aren't quite as certain about the science now as they were four years ago. So it's one thing then to argue, as you do, that, um, that the world is not going to move. But Tony Abbott says far more than that. He portrays us as the most damaging mm. policy initiative in a decade mm. and that whole industries, even towns, are going to close down. Mm. Is that but, an exaggeration? No, look, I, I, look <laughs> I've heard a lot about you know, Tony Abbott's alleged exa exaggerations. I mean, the, the truth is that he's fighting a very tough and effective campaign against something that he that he doesn't believe in. And can I just remind you of something else, Barry, that the, the Liberal Party changed its leader over the issue of emissions trading. And leaving aside what your view is, what Tony Abbott is articulating uh, is a very strongly uh, critical approach on this issue, and which is very different from the position that the Liberal Party had um, previously. But is he fighting fair? I mean, to talk about oh, petrol going, say, going up by six cents a litre. I mean, hang on. I mean, you know, uh, you say is he fighting fair? I mean, the, the, you know, people people start criticising the, the Liberal Party for having an effective negative campaign, as if it, they're the first party in the world that's ever done it. I mean, uh, heavens above, I seem to remember my predecessor calling something a monster new tax that would 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 bring about a lifestyle change, and and the world would never be the same again. And you know. Only a few years early, he very strongly supported a similar tax. On industrial relations, well, would, would you like to see him revisit that? Well, let me just say, I mean, how he handles the tactics of industrial relations is a matter for him. And one of the things I, I promised myself uh, after I uh, went out of politics was that I wouldn't give day-to-day -day tactical advice. I mean, you asked me about the issue of industrial relations. I think it's a tragedy that Julia Gillard has re-regulated the labour market. Uh, for the first time in a generation, 
a major economic reform has been reversed and uh, I think that this nation will have to revisit industrial relations in the future uh, and the calamitous retreat on that issue will do us steadily more harm as the years go by and uh, I hope that the system produces uh, a, a revisitation of industrial relations because I believe in it. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with individual contracts. We made a mistake in 2006 in taking away the no disadvantage test, but um, we'd had individual contracts for 11 years. They weren't a product of work choices. They were a product of REACH 1996 Act. Uh, and I do believe for very small businesses, you need relief from the current unfair dismissal laws. So you want to see uh, reversed what Julia Gillard has already I, reversed? I, you know, I, well, I, I, want, I want to go back... To, at the very, I want to go back to the pre-work uh, choices position then add to that uh, something on unfair dismissal. Now, they're my views. Whether the Liberal Party picks those views up or not uh, is entirely a matter for it. And I'm not going to be running around the country every day spruiking it. But you ask me a view on a policy issue I feel very strongly about. And uh, I think it was an error. Gillard went too far. She didn't just abolish work choices. She went back to the pre-1992 position and we have a very heavily regulated labour market and we're going to pay ever more dearly for that as time goes by. But then you pay dearly for, for work choices yeah. and that would still be fresh in Tony Abbott's mind. Look, that's the tactical side of it. You're asking me what I believe in. OK, I, I paid dearly for it. It was one of the reasons why we lost. It wasn't the only reason and in my view it wasn't the main reason. The main reason we lost was I think people wanted to change. The it's time factor, that, that always comes into play. But if you're talking to me about policy principle, I believed uh, in industrial relations reform and I think it's a great pity for this country that it's been totally reversed. But I don't expect Tony Abbott to do what uh, necessarily what I'm saying. It's a matter for him. And I should say for the record that of all the senior ministers in my cabinet, in 2005 when we debated work choices, Tony Abbott was less enthusiastic about change than any of the others. On uh, news, uh, the news media and given mm. events in the in the UK and the, the closing down of news of the world, there does seem to be an appetite growing in, in part of politics to uh, to take this on, uh, to take on the media in this country. What well, I think, think this is that? ridiculous. I mean, uh, look, argue with the media on particular issues but there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the Australian media. You know, I agree with some of what it writes and says and, and others I don't. And as for bias, well, I mean, I listen to Labor people talking about media bias. Give me a break. I mean, they can't... They ought to remember what Harry Truman said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And uh, uh, I think this idea that Bob Brown is floating and Julia Gillard is yapping along behind him, apparently, they want to have um, uh, an inquiry into the media... I mean, the media has been inquired into into death in this country. Uh, they better be careful. They might, you know, might have a revisitation of that, you know, famous appearance of Kerry Packer before the media, the Senate inquiry, where he really bashed them up. I mean, heavens mm -hmm. above, um, let the media do its job. Uh, we don't want another inquiry. Did you ever worry in government about the dominance, though, of News Limited and Rupert Murdoch? And, and did you ever feel as if he threw his weight around to too great an extent? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, and, and in the end, we should remember that the media doesn't have nearly as much influence on events in Australia as politicians often think. I'm reminded of the Republican referendum in 1999 when, as you'll remember, Barry, News Limited, Fairfax and the ABC were almost screaming together in unison at the Australian public to vote yes, and they voted no. And the only sections of the Australian media that were really strongly opposed to uh, a yes vote were some of the talkback people. I thought at the time you'd set back the cause of a republic for about 10 years, but it looks like being a whole lot more than that. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, look, I, I think it's, it, it's a very low-level issue with the Australian public, even amongst uh, passionate Republicans. You were in politics for 33 years. What do you most miss, miss about it now? Oh, I, I, I miss the opportunity of doing things that I think are good for the country. I loved it. Uh, people say to me, do you miss being Prime Minister? I say, yes, I do, but have you adjusted? Yes, I have. I mean, you, you go on to the next phase of your life, but uh, the opportunity of doing things, the opportunity of debating ideas, engaging in the cut and thrust of 
uh, of discussing uh, public affairs issues. Uh, it's a never-ending fascination for me, and uh, uh, I, of course I miss it, but I had a terrific run. I mean, 33 years and almost 12 as Prime Minister, you can't complain about that. Thanks for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. Thanks.